I'm Joel Hargis with the Florida Aviation Network. We are here at Spruce Creek Fly-In Community here today, continuing our veteran flyer series. It's a beautiful day. Um, Spruce Creek's just awesome. It's the largest fly-in community in the world, and uh, they got a whole bunch of aircraft out here, but better than that, they got a bunch of really cool pilots out here. And today, we're going to talk to a real neat one. has got a great story, and that is Jim Stewart. Hi, yeah, I'm Jim Stewart. Uh, moved here about two years ago, uh, ex-Air Force guy, Southwest Airlines, and uh, run another company now called VK. But it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a privilege, and uh, grace of God we're sitting here today. Amen. So, J Jim, thanks for taking time to, to talk with us today. Um, you know, and just, you know, doing the, uh, my homework before we started this interview, you've, you've flown some cool, cool stuff. But I want to start in the beginning. So how old were you and where were you when you learned how to fly? Yeah, sure. Well, I think like everybody else, I kind of just stumbled into it. I remember in ninth grade walking through the library looking for something interesting to read, and I found a book on World War II flying aces. You know, and back in those days, guys could fly like a bunch of different airplanes because aviation was just getting cranked up, and, and there was a bunch of money obviously being pumped into it. So I really became fascinated with uh, airplanes that look like this, which were, you know, back in those days, uh, the Corsairs and the P-51s, obviously, uh, and some of the German stuff was pretty cool, too. But, you know, mostly I was a Spitfire guy. I thought that was the coolest airplane ever, and the whole Battle of Britain thing was awesome. So, you know, that kind of lit the fire that, that never really went out. I always wanted to fly. So when, how old were you when you started taking lessons? Uh, I was kind of a – my first lesson was when I was 18. Uh, I had some other things athletically that I was kind of pursuing. So once that uh, – kind of reached this logical end. I knew it was time to, to do something else. Yeah, to go with the real dream of, you know, being a pilot that was going right. to pay the bills, which it does, and, does pretty well. And and at that time, so you were 18, so did you get your private before you looked at the military, or how did that all? Uh, that's interesting. So I uh, went into ROTC at uh, Georgia State, and I was a cadet wing commander at Georgia Tech uh, in the ROTC program there. So as I went through that, um, I joined as a NAV and then uh, got a pilot slot halfway through my junior year. Um, and uh, they said, look, you know, if you if you go to get your pilot slot, uh, if you go get your private pilot's license first, then you'll you'll skip uh, what was called fish pot which at the time, which is flight screening program. Oh, okay. And uh, so I thought, you know what, I've, I've got a credit card. It's got the $3,000 limit. I just went and handed it to the FBO and and off I went, you know, and then uh, what were you flying? Yeah, so I started, uh, I think I soloed in the uh, uh, Cessna 150, like everybody else on the planet. And then, you know, obviously, as soon as I could, I wanted to get into a cool airplane like yours and fly something low wing. So the day I flew my private pilot check, I was the last day I flew uh, anything high wing. Really? Uh, so, yeah, so then I've been in things like so this. So, yeah, like ironically, our backdrop here is actually Jim's RV4. And uh, you I bet you go up and do a little aerobatics in that, don't uh, you? It has some aerobatic time on it, yeah. Yeah, I bet you do. We'll, we'll come back to that. So, ROTC, come out, joined the Air Force. Yeah, I uh, got to go to Reese Pilot Training Base, which has been shut down uh, since then. Where was that at? Uh, that's in Lubbock, Texas. Okay. Or was. Yeah, it's a great place to learn how to fly. Uh, they say in the Air Force, if you go to Columbus, you learn how to fly instruments. If you go to Reese, you learn how to fly in crosswinds. So that's, okay. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's out in the middle of Plains and, you know, nowhere right. in Zool, Texas. Uh, but, uh, you know, luckily the Texas Tech was there. So that's where I met my uh, wife. And oh. uh, so that kind of worked out pretty well. And went from there, flew uh, C-130s for three years at, uh, in Vietnam, which is commonly known as uh, Pope Air Force Base, which is now uh, Pope, I think, it's, uh, I think it's Pope Army Airfield now, actually. Okay. But it was a really cool deal. You know, we flew with the helicopter guys, um, did a lot of real world combat stuff. Uh, did a lot of spec ops. In the C-130. In the C-130. Yep. Um, which uh, I think for me was awesome. It was, uh, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but, you know, I got to fly over, all over Europe. Uh, I'd been to like 30 countries in three years. Wow. It was absurd. Yeah. Did some. Uh, That's cool. Some, a lot of classified missions. Did a lot uh, with the spec ops, especially the Delta Force guys uh, at Bragg. And uh, cool. really, you know, you end up with a whole different respect because you're kind of like, you know, there's all that inter-service rivalry Right. so to speak and then the more you the more you fly with the army guys the more you realize you know you're dropping them off you've briefed this mission you've been up for you know nine or ten hours and you drop them off the drop zone you know you kind of watch them go 
and then you peel off and go home and you know go drink cokes <laughs> and they go to work and their days go yeah right they got 72 hours of insanity right. uh coming up oh and gosh. you know you just try to deliver them there and hopefully they're not too air sick to do the mission um but uh <clears throat> yeah it's a ton of respect for those guys in the sports you know the, the spec ops guys are the best in the world at what they do so that's pretty awesome. cool yeah we were just getting to the night vision era and uh we flew we had spec ops uh one and two that we were pushing through there so good times good times so the C-130, but I know you've flown some really cool stuff since then. And, and a lot of guys that go cargo who never get, get out of cargo. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're you know, n- almost never get a fighter job sure. or anything else. How did you? Oh, well. What, what'd, you, what'd you fly next? Oh, so, well, I'd done pretty well in the T-38 in pilot training and selected the, T-1 th- the, the C-130. Uh, and then... Uh, at that point, I well, I got to stop back for a minute because I got to plug the T thirty eight. Okay. To me, I I mean that's the plane I would love to go for a ride in. Yep. And I've been up in the L thirty nine. You know, I've flown an L thirty nine, but a T thirty eight for those that you don't know, a very sexy airplane, cool lines, but it's where everybody goes supersonic. For the first time, so yeah. that's kind of why I want to. I mean, I, and I'm told they're just wonderful to fly. It's a fantastic airplane. You know, those things were built in the late '50s with slide <laughs> rule. You know, we didn't. Nobody had computers back then. But uh, well, Jay's not here. But you know, the test pilot school looked at the T-38 as a standard for uh, man machine interface with the uh, with the instrument cross check. Just a great intuitive airplane to fly. Uh, and you know, considering the fact you're, you know, it's supersonic and flies down final at 155 knots with no gas in it, uh, it can be a challenge. You know, I mean, these, these things are. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, they're you know they're trainers for the uh, F100. And the, it kind of it kind of sets you up for all the fast jets, though. I mean, yeah, for sure. If you can land the T38, you're probably gonna certainly. I mean, do you ever fly? Uh, oh, uh, like an F. Well, did you fly an F4? Yeah, I got a ride. I got a F4D ride. And. Uh, another beautiful, just an amazing, super smooth airplane. I mean, you know, just insane. Uh, down low, felt like a Cadillac, and you know, of course, it'll fly Mach two. And well, well, I, yeah, yeah, we no, got. I got an F four driver. Yeah. To <laughs> I'll talk. let him brag on. Uh, airplane. We'll let we'll let him deep dive that one. Yeah. Um. So, flying T thirty eight. What's next? Uh. Yeah. Well, from there, uh, since I had both heavy time and and uh, fast mover time, the Air Force uh, was standing up the. Uh, uh, dual track program, I think is what they called it. So we split the uh, the cargo guys would split after flying the T thirty seven. Now the T six, they would uh, they would split off the track and either go fly the beach jet or the T thirty eight if you're going to go to fighter bombers. So uh, uh, I was flying the T thirty eight in Del Rio, Texas, which is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the wife's like, hey, let's let's move back to Reese, you know, have a little bit of a you know do the social event thing. Um, and she's a Texas Tech grad, so we had to go do all those football games. Uh, <laughs> you know how that works, right? Uh, so I went from a super sexy airplane to, uh, you know, a biz jet, which is not even on the same planet. Right. So I'm like, you know, kind of, uh, it was fun. Boring. I, I, yeah, <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, but uh, so that's, I ended up in the beach jet, and then the opportunity came up to fly the U-2. And that's when I made the transition. A, it let me uh, fly a really cool single-seat airplane to the edge of space. Uh, at the time, I was looking at going to uh, TPS and maybe uh, looking at NASA. So it, it gave me the, you know, I checked a couple more boxes there. Um, like I said before, one of my goals was to try to fly as many airplanes as I could right. in the Air Force. And that added, uh, you know, two more with the U-2R model and the U-2S model. So uh, I went out and interviewed out there. The craziest thing I've ever done. Uh, I, I jumped in, uh, landed in front of base ops. And uh, a friend of mine who'd beat me out there by about a year picked me up in front of base operations in a Mustang five liter with a bubble gum machine on the top. And we take off down the taxiway and he's going 110 on the taxiway. And I'm like, I'm in the right seat. And I'm like, you know, I knew you were crazy, but this, this is like the limit. <laughs> what are you doing, man? We're both going to jail. And we go flying past the, the sky cops, right? The Air Force security police. And they just wave at us. And I'm just like, I think I've landed on a different planet. That none of this happens in the Air Force ever. You know, you drive 26 right. miles an hour, you know, you're in trouble. So uh, we come <laughs> screaming around the corner, and then the airplane is up coming around the final turn. And uh, uh, Randy, Randy Roby is uh, my buddy. He's talking on the radio, driving with one hand. So I think he's, yeah, he's left-handing it, talking on the radio. And, and basically, you talk the guy uh, in through the final portion of the landing. 
So as he comes in, you kind of fly a rejoin with the car. The car kind of flies over, or the airplane flies over the car, and then now you're like situated behind the behind the airplane while he's still flying. And and the approach speed on short final in a U two is yeah, they're you know they're seventy five to eighty knots, so we're probably going ninety five miles an hour, hundred miles an hour. But we're you know the airplane's flying and we're we're fifteen feet behind it, and I'm like. <laughs> this is insane. This is the coolest thing I've ever. Yeah, had. that's what they do because so, they're uh, they're going to tell the pilot. Yeah, exactly. They're judging the height of the main gear off the runway. Right. Uh, by five feet. The main gear is about feet, two feet, three feet. Right. right? Yeah. So and that's the call. Like, cross. Yeah. Crash, uh, threshold crossing height is ten feet, and from there you're just kind of judge it. And it's a you know it's a tail dragger airplane, so they're uh, he's giving right rudder calls and altitude calls basically. Oh, really? So, yeah, because the, the airplane's a so, tandem. So, yeah, so you can't see out the nose of the U-2 very well. You can see, but it's... your nose high? Yeah, well, it's like these. You're, out, you're sitting so far on the front of the airplane, there's not a lot of visual reference as far as yaw goes. Oh, uh, okay. You know, and that's compounded by the fact that you're in a spacesuit. You might have been airborne for, you know... Hours. It's a classified number, but it's over 10. Uh, it could have been a really long mission, and you could be tired, dehydrated, um... And yeah, uh, you know, and now you got it up, you know, human factors this, wise, you're in the 14 hour kind of danger zone. This thing that's basically a glider. Uh, yeah, it's a jet power glider. So I, I actually had a good friend that was a U2 driver and um, he has since passed away, but he would talk about and, and I want you to talk about. So like. That thing, everything's good until it isn't, and when it isn't, it's real bad. What the, yeah. Something with the dragon or something. Oh. What, what is? Yeah. So the you know the legend is you can dance. It's called the Dragon Lady. Okay. So, uh, the 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 but words of wisdom are why, you can yeah. you can you can dance with the lady or you can you can try to slay the dragon. And um, it's a uh, it's a weird airplane. You know, it's a uh, it's got a lot. The, you know, it's got a 108 foot wingspan, which means uh, at a slow speed, you can end up with the inner wing, you know, kind of going backwards. Uh, it's really hard to recover from a stall. A friend of mine's got got into a stall spin uh, once and kind of did a prevent out of it, you know, just a push and recovery. Um, but it's different than any other airplane you've ever flown. And it's it's comfortable until it's not right. So uh, and you, I, I've I think heard those very is, words said. It's yeah. comfortable until it's not. Right. And then it goes south real quick. Yeah. And then, you know, most guys think they can recover the airplane. And, you know, if you're down low, you're probably not going to recover. So we had uh, we had several um, fatalities while I was there. And I, I'm told and you got to have on. the best hands because just little itty bitty changes make bad things yeah. happen. Well, actually, you know, I was thinking about that this morning as we were, we we're sitting here. You know, the thing that makes aviation so challenging is. Um, a lot of people look like you're kind of like dancing on the edge, right? You're uh, that we're risk takers and we go out and do crazy things and we just kind of, you know, recover from it. And the, the, the cold reality of it is that uh, most really good pilots are anything but extreme risk takers. We do an awful lot agree. of, yeah, you know, you do a lot of pre-flight planning in the airplane. You know exactly, you know, where your divert fields are, what you're going to do in every phase of flight to, to make you make sure you survive. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of key. So people look at us like, extreme risk takers but most of us are methodical planners and do an awful lot of homework to make it look easy and kind of on game day one of my and again has since passed but joe kittinger you ever meet yeah. joe kittinger you would think he has taken some crazy risks he was the most methodical thought out you know and yeah. straight to what you say because he did some crazy stuff yeah right <laughs> right there's and, always uh, a way out though but he, yeah no he was he's an engineer as much as he is a pilot but anyway um so was that your favorite plane you've ever flown i think the t-38 is the favorite the u-2 is something i really enjoyed flying how many missions it, you get in u-2 oh uh i had somewhere around 110 combat hours or something like that wow in, uh, and uh Saudi mostly, which was a really cool mission, and it, it, that that mission was the ultimate in teamwork because you had to have um, a rivet joint, uh, you know, basically AB Triple C uh, airborne command control out. Um, we had a dedicated four ship of either F-15s or F-16s at the time, 
uh, the Saudis, not the Saudis, the Iraqis were still running intercepts on us using the Fox Bat, the MiG 25s. Really? Which could they could get a headshot if they got the, if they got the uh, intercept correct and had the AA-10 on board. Because you're going so fast. So yeah, it, you know, I mean, we're like a we're calculation. going 0.7, and they're going you know Mach two to get the nose, and they would pitch up, and and if they got in the weapon employment zone, they could you know they could get a shot off. Our job was to make that not happen, and of course we had the F-15s usually uh, with the uh, aim sevens that were kind of stood off in the background you know they'd rotate uh, they pitch back in and, and and lock up the mig so it was an interesting deal but you know we had also had AWACS and a and a tanker dedicated tanker because so, the u2 is completely defenseless uh yeah you know altitude's all your is basically your defense and uh right. you can I mean, alternate you, you don't anything. have flares or chaff or no it's none of that it, it, every pound sacrifices an uh, a foot of altitude uh so you know the altitude's wow. important because, and max yeah, altitude can you share that uh, it's over 70. You can. There's a couple of videos on YouTube you can watch, but that's all I can tell you. It's over 70. Wow. So that's pretty exciting stuff. So it's as close as being an astronaut as you can get, I think, is, and at this point in time. Actually, yeah. Do it. it. It always felt like a privilege to fly that mission because there's so many dedicated people on that team to get you in the jet and airborne and, and get the mission done. So you sent me and some the, great pictures. I'm Because I mean, yeah, it's just it's just very very cool. So, uh, how long did you stay in the Air Force? Uh, I did twelve active, and I did uh, several other years after that in the reserves. What rank did you come yeah, out so, as? Uh, I left active duty as a captain, got uh, basically promoted to major my first day in the reserves. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it and was, now it's good in the civilian life. Uh, I went through, uh, did twenty years at Southwest, and now I'm uh, CEO of a company called VK My Way. We do. Uh, it's like uh, B&B with no fee structure. So oh. we've been in business about three years, and we're at uh, currently right at 10,000 properties. And Good for you. It's you starting to go worldwide. Well, we'll it made me think about, too, you know, this morning. Yeah, exactly, please. Uh, that, you know, you learn so much in aviation about, uh, like we talked about, planning and performance. And then one thing we really stress is the debrief. And I think, you know, you and I talked before about some of your uh, safety situations in airplanes, which we've all had. And I think the most critical thing is to is to be able to have the self confidence to look back and go, you know, I could have done that better. Oh and, yeah, and that's oh, uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, here in Spruce Creek, you see a lot of people that are. Uh, there's a lot of CEOs, CFOs, a lot of retired airline guys, uh, and I think you know the crucial thing that you learn from aviation um, is how to work as a team and how to do all that planning. And then there's just this personality type, you know, that is always continuously driving for success and excellence, and that's. Yeah, so yeah, I see you nodding. So that's, your, that's what keeps you alive, right? In, I mean, oh, for sure. In business it, and in aviation, for it, sure. It, and you know, I I, I enjoy aviation because it makes me think. Oh yeah, right. I mean, you got to. There is no. You don't have a B day when you're flying an airplane. You just yeah. Better not do that. Better just sit on the ground. But uh, so this like this RV four behind you. Do a little formation flying in that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know there's plenty of crazy guys out here <laughs> at Spruce Creek to right. fly formation with. I know a bunch of them. Well, I'll tell you, you know, and it's it's not quite T-38 uh, style, <laughs> uh, you know, mix it up every now and then. The instructor pilots would uh, either stay early or come in late uh, or uh, come in early or stay late and go fly uh, what was called T, uh, T-3 T at the time, which is IP on IP. And that generates pretty quickly a lot of times into some kind of maneuvering that may or may not be, uh, you know. And that's where you that's where you really learn though right and it's that's the most challenging thing i think it's uh it's essentially like a modern day night you know you come rolling in on on your steed and go to war and, and it's uh it's super challenging and it's the, it's the most thrilling thing i've ever done in my life without so he, for sure what he's talking is about dog fighting is what he's talking about right that's formation <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll just leave that there. But and you know, I uh, I actually well, got, you're, you're teaching fighter guys, right? So that's the whole lead right. in into T38s is 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 into fast jets, and all those guys are going to go to you know introduction to fighter fundamentals, or uh, and then go fly you know something else all the way up to right. an F35 or F22 now. Uh, so it's important that you know you give them a good basis of uh, you know lead and lag and those kind of uh, formation uh, principles that are going to keep them safe. So, right. Yeah. That's it. I, I got about to, safety. I got to fly with the Texaco performance team two years ago, at, uh, a year and a half ago at Sun and Fun, and and uh, 
that was probably the tightest formation that I've ever gotten to fly. And I mean, those guys are really tight, right? And I mean, it, if you're flying wing, it's all about the wing. You don't yeah. look forward ever. Right, just, right. Just, just, yeah. just wing. I mean, they fly you into the ground, you're going in the ground because all you're looking at is the wing. No, it takes a lot of skill. It really does. Well, it keeps um, you sharp. Oh, yeah. You got to fly really tight. It's, it's, it's cool stuff. So, um, flying this now, you said you've been here, what, three years? Uh, come, just coming up on a year and a half. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. What brought you to Spruce so, Creek? Um, you know, I'd always heard about it, and the first time I came up here, actually, I was uh, with my broker, real estate broker, and we were looking for, uh, I think there, I was looking for a hangar home. There's one house available, and uh, we looked at it, and I really fell in love with it, and then we came out to uh, the restaurant down here, and it turned out it was uh, the Christmas vacation, uh, the Christmas parade, and uh, they're huge parade of cars, crazy, you know, collector cars, and there's a bunch of cool airplanes, and this guy drove by um, with a, I think, a 757 uh, airliner engine that was sitting on top of a, some kind of a frame. I know it. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty wild. And then he shoots this gigantic fireball out the back, and I was just like, this place is crazy. It's perfect. You, I can fit right in here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. And pilots that's are – Spruce Creek for you, though. Not oh. Notoriously a little crazy. Well, and then, you know, I saw a couple of the formations flying. I like, like to have fun. Yeah, these guys are really good here. I mean, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a lot they of really sure strong aviators. And uh, I looked at these formations, and I thought, you know, these guys, are they got to be current reservists. They're probably, you know, airline guys on their day off. And, it, you know, they rolled in, and, and the youngest guy in the formation was 80. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, no, that, it's, yeah, it's, it's And there's it's multiple groups of formation oh, yeah. flyers out here, I, I know, you know. It, it's 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 a great place to live. So let me ask you. So for any young people out there thinking about maybe a, a career in the Air Force or you know wanting to learn how to fly, obviously you've got several years of commercial flying. What what advice would you give them? Uh, I would say, uh, well, first of all, it's a great career. I would I would do it again in a second. Um, I I think it's in this world. There's very few things you can do that are as satisfying as flying airplanes. Um, I've always said, you know, you show up the first day in the military and, and they go, you know, I'm, I'm like, so how fast do we fly? I mean, what kind of power setting do we use on departure? And they go, I oh, use a hundred percent. I'm like, what? And they go, yeah, we fly wide open pretty much all the way out until you, you know, and I'm like, I like this place, you know, it's, and so, uh, you know, and then you're flying over your, your, your buddies are down there doing a pre-flight in their airplane and, and you get, you know, get shoved off the pattern to the inside if you have a conflict. And now you get to fly over the airfield at, you know, 100 feet as fast as you can go. And, you know, you're looking down at your friends pre-flighting their jet and going. And then you get a closed pattern pull up at the other end of the field. It's just, it's, it's the kind of full speed activities that very few people get to do in this right. day and age. You can never drive as fast as you can drive. You can never do any of those things. And the Air Force is something that will challenge you. Uh, all the way to the limit of your ability and and you may be able to push that you know there's and that's really the cool thing is you know what's the air force going to be like in in 10 years i mean who knows but it'll be something that nobody imagines at this point so i think if you're if you really want to get out and do cool things that nobody else gets to do and very few people you know you're flying along you know like in the u2 at seventy thousand feet you look around and you go i can't believe i'm getting to do this yeah you know? i that has to be surreal like pinch me every day is, is a privilege and a, and a blessing from god to be able to, to do things like this so i certainly appreciate it and then you know the american uh public i appreciate the trust that they put in all of us to go do those kind of things and uh, definitely something i would recommend well, I, sure. I can tell you speaking for the american public thank you for your service and the fact that you're out doing that um sure well it, somebody's got to do it and and uh Cheers to you, my Somebody friend. Somebody has to do it. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, well, thank you. Thanks for inviting Thanks me on for the interview. Coming. So I am Joel Hargis with the Florida Aviation Network here in beautiful Spruce Creek with Jim Stewart. Great interview. Stay tuned. We got more.